All right, boom. So we recording. Um, so we're going to jump into in Google. I'm going to kind of point out some things that I thought were important or significant. And again, we could use that for our fishbowl discussion or not, but this is some things that stood out to me. Um, and then we'll lead that into our fishbowl conversation. Um, if we have time, we may do some breakout rooms. Um, if not, you know, we'll end with the fishbowl conversation. All right. Uh, Professor, can yeah. you um, record the, uh, the lecture? Yeah, thank you, Samantha. No, I, I did push record, so we are recording. Thank you for reminding me. All right. So one of the things to me, well, first and foremost, um, this book is called um, Decolonizing, Decolonizing the Mind, the Political Language of African Literature, in African Literature, right? So this is the, the title of the book. But with that title in consideration, one of the things that first came to me as a point of concern or a point of emphasis or interest is, you know, what is the project that Ngugi is trying to engage and what project is he trying to bring his, his readers along into, right? So that's one thing that I'm thinking. And then he, he mentions um, this notion of language and the destiny of Africa being tied together, right? So I'm like, well, what does that mean? What, what, what are you trying to get us to think about as it pertains to the destiny of Africa being tied to a language, right? So that's my first thought. Then he goes into this notion of the problems of Africa not being caused by tribalism, but by imperialism and by colonialism, right? So that's, that's something of great emphasis that I think we cannot read through this and gloss over, right? So uh, according to Ngugi, all the problems that Africa face is due to tribalism and colonialism, not due to Africa itself, right? There's nothing innately wrong with Africa. Um, any victory against imperialism is a victory for the anti-imperialist. I think that's a good point of emphasis. Um, the language of the oppressed or the colonized as a unifying force, right? So what common modes of language is being speaks um, through those who are considered colonized or those who are considered oppressed? Is there a com commonality of language that can be found there? Um, this idea of the cultural bomb of imperialism and how that affects African languages. Um, and then he says also that African, the language of the oppressed is, is central to the culture of struggle, right? So the oppressed create a culture of struggle and that's developed through language. Um, this idea of language and ontology or language and self-definition, definition, definition, excuse me. So how you understand yourself and it being tied to language. The contradiction of being a Pan-Africanist or being pro-African, but then using European um, language to articulate your pro-African position, right? He finds that as a contradiction. Um, and then that is also heightened or highlighted in the Conference of African Writers of English Expression, right? So what is Ngugi's in issue with that conference, right? What is the problem, according to Ngugi, with the Conference of African Writers of English expression, okay? Um, the paradox of the mother tongue and of fatalistic logic, right? So I'm, con I'm concerned with that as well. And then can we use Western language to articulate African ideas, African philosophies, right? And then and when you think about that, think about what we read last week with Maladoma Patrice Somme and what were some of the difficulties that he had in producing his autobiography, it relates to this notion of um, can Western languages articulate African expressions, okay? Um, then he goes into this notion of a pro the production of a new English. What does that look like? What does that sound like? Is there examples of expressions of new English? And then, um, so, and he usually, he does use examples, right? West African, um, Nigerian English, or Ghanaian English, right? Um, and then he also poses this question, you know, how does African writers become so feeble towards the claims of their own language? And then finally, he makes this comparison of subjugation, right? physical and spiritual subjugation. And he says, the physical subjugation was produced by the canon, 
the spiritual subjugation was produced by language, right? So I think that's something that we should think about and we should meditate on as we engage in Ngugi. So a little bit about Ngugi himself, and this may help you contextualize his writing a little bit more. So he's from Kenya, right? Um, he predominantly writes in Kikuyu, which is the native language of Kenya, or Bantu, which is a secondary language, which is an indigenous language in, in Kenya. So which you guys did not read, but in this book, in the preface, he says that this will be the last book that he's writing in English. So this was published in 1984. Um, everything that Ngugi publishes after that is written in either Kikuyu or Bantu. So what does that say about what he's up to in this book, right? Um, he got his BA in, in Africa and Uganda at the University of, of Mercury. He got his graduate's degree in Le at Leeds University in England. Um, he won a prize for a book called Weep Not Child. Now, the novel was about a, a family that was pulled into the Mau Mau Rebellion or the Mau Mau Uprising. Now, um, why that's significant? If you think about what Ngugi is arguing, is very much situated in that novel and in that story. So Kenya was a British colony, right? So the British came into Kenya and they took over Kenya. Kenya had a very... Um, strong cultural revolution that took place that turned into an actual physical revolution, right? Where they had armed struggle against the British and they were able to overthrow the British and run them out of Kenya. And they placed um, Yomo Kenyatta as the president of newly liberated Kenya. Now, a large part of that revolutionary thrust was the Mau Mau's, right? M-A-U, M-A-U. Um, in fact, if those familiar with Rastafari or the music of Bob Marley, who sings heavily about Rastafari, a part of that is the uh, locks culture or your hair being knotted into locks or what you may call as inaccurately dreadlocks, right? That also derived from the Mau Mau Rebellion. The Mau Mau is one of the first people to wear their hair in locks um, as a symbol to um, rebel against the straight haired, um, blonde haired, professional look of their oppressor, right? So there's a cultural nuance that takes place when you look at this idea of, red, of dreadlocks, which is most inaccurately called. Um, it has roots in the Kenya Mau Mau revolution, right? So this is all the things that are informing Ngugi in his writing, right? Um, and now, as I looked it up as of last year, 2019, um, he's a professor at the University of Irvine. Um, he teaches critical literature and, and then he's in the School of Humanities. Um, that is important just because as you guys are going along your academic journey, if you find somebody whose writing you know, appeals to you, their work sticks out and you can relate to it, take some time out to try to reach out to those individuals, right? Especially if they're in California. Um, Irvine is like an hour drive from LA, right? Um, you would be surprised how willing these individuals are to sit down with you and discuss their writing and discuss their ideas and discuss what got them to where they're at in, in, to the, in the space of producing this work, right? So that can inform your intellectual practice. Um, intellects and academics are not like celebrities to where they're standoffish, they don't want to be bothered. They very much want to talk about their work, right? So if there is someone who stands out to you, reach out. And, and, and you know, see if you can kind of pull their coattail and you'll be surprised how they're willing they will be to pull you along and mentor you. So that is my um, point of interest as it pertains to Ngugi. Um, before we jump into our fishbowl, is there any general questions, comments, or concerns? All right. So again, with the fishbowl, if you have went already, you're good to go. Um, remind me if you've gone already and I call on you, just let me know I've already went. Um, again, you have uh, one time to pass. So if you passed already, then you don't um, have the opportunity to pass this time. Um, and then again, you don't have to talk about anything specific, anything that you found of interest in the reading, you can talk about that and that will qualify you for your participation in the fishbowl. Um, does anybody want to volunteer to fishbowl? And then Miracle, I noticed you're having, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Jocelyn, were you going to say something? Oh, yeah, wait, was somebody else going to say something? 
I don't know, you have the floor right now. So if you want to say something, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I volunteer for the fish bowl, is that okay? okay. Perfect, yep. Thank you for that. So a few things I have to say. Oh, hold on, is... let's, get the, let's get the rest of the people on the fish bowl first, okay? Give us one second. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. What I was going to say, though, Miracle, if you're having issues connecting, sometimes if you turn your camera off, it'll give you a better connection. Okay, I think I'll just do that. Yeah, yeah. my internet's bad, sorry. Yeah, no worries, try that. Okay, so we have Jocelyn for the fishbowl. Um, Precious, have you fishbowled already or are you okay with fishbowling? Uh, I already went. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so we have Mastrat Gera and Mastrat Pena. Um, have either of you fishbowled already? Um, I haven't fishbowled yet. Are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yes. Okay, so we'll have it write you down as well. Thank you for that. Um, I haven't fishbowled either. Okay, and did you want to fishbowl today or did you want to pass? No, uh, I'll fishbowl. Okay, thank you. Yes, we got you guys. Um, so both of you are good for the semester. Uh, and so we'll we'll have so for today's fishbowl is going to be Jocelyn, um, Maserat Guerra, and then uh, Maserat Pena for our fish bowlers. So um, Jocelyn, you could start it off. And then from there, uh, the, you guys would, um, the rest of the other two would join in and then we'll have an overall class discussion. Okay, so I actually had two um, questioning thoughts, I think. The first one was, um, what was his main motive slash inspiration to write it? And secondly, um, I know, like, well, I feel like I might badly word it, but um, you said he was from Kenya, correct? Hello? Yes, he's from Kenya, yep. Oh, okay, you're there. Um, and so, like, I know, like, um, with throughout the states, every, like, region or actual state has a certain stereotype or characteristic of the demographic like when you say california you think avocados and liberals or when you think of alabama it's something else so what are the main like what are some characteristics of kenya that could give us an insight into like the type of like culture or environment and demographics and class and whatnot that he was raised in to reflect how he wrote the book and what he's saying and where he's coming from because like if he's like some like middle class or like upper middle class African man writing this, it's a lot different than someone of another class or another region and blah, 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 blah. Right. So, um, so kind of to, to situate, not necessarily answer your question, but to situate your thinking, um, which are, you're posing very good questions, right? Um, so one, you think about the motivate, actually both of your questions could be kind of responded to in the same breath, right? When you think about the motivations and the cultural characteristics of the, um, the Kenyans um, is rooted in what I was discussing about with the, the Mau Mau, right? Um, one thing with colonialism that's a little bit different from racism, um, colonialism is a little bit universal in the sense that if you're colonized, it doesn't matter about your class, right? You won't have the ability to, to achieve class um, elevation because of you're in a colonial state, right? To where racism is a little bit more lax in the sense that someone who is black, right, may be able to obtain some type of um, class privilege. So the distinction that Jocelyn is trying to make in, well, are you an upper class African or are you a lower class African is a little less at play in the colonial state because in the colonial state, you're just colonized, right? So that's the only characteristic or the only distinction that you would have that, you, that, that it carries, right? Um, and then, so keep, keep that in mind. And then far as the circumstances that produce this book, Again, it goes back to that Mau Mau revolution, right? This is a, uh, a post-colonial time, and this is a, a society that physically overthrew their colonial uh, oppressors, right? They engaged in a revolutionary struggle, right? Blood was spilled. Clon um, colonizing lives were lost, right? Colonized lives were lost. So all of that is informing the way that he views the world and the way that he views his project of decolonizing the mind.
And then there are two other fish bowls. You guys could chime in at this point. Okay. Um, I actually thought about the reading that how it was unfair to how they were only limited to what they could write about and how they could write it. So they weren't really able to explain what they wanted to write. Am I like, am I making sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, I just thought that it was, yeah, like that it was unfair and people should be able to write what they want in their language so they could, so they could better explain it. And also for us as well to write in English for, for them to write in English so we could all understand better their culture as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's all really thought about the, like, that's what really stood out to me. Okay. Cool. Reading. Good point. So what do you think, because well, if I, I could, I could surmise your point, right? You're, you're highlighting the restricted nature of their ability to express themselves, right? So um, what do you think contributed to those restrictions? Like, what are some of the things that felt, that caused them to feel restricted in their ability to express what they wanted to? Um, well, how he says in page six, um, in the third paragraph, he like he act, he asks himself like questions like, what what does qualify as African literature, and were Af were African language the the criteria like if it met the criteria? Yeah. So they uh -huh. weren't really aware of what they couldn't couldn't do. Yes, but but let's let's kind of go up a little bit further because we have to situate where those questions are being derived from, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the top of page six, and this directly ties into what you're saying. And so at the top of page six, he says, the title, A Conference of African Writers of English Expression, automatically excluded those who write in, in African languages. Now, on looking back from the self-questioning heights of 1986, I can see that this contained absurd anomalies. So there's a lot going on in that little sentence, right? But we got, let's kind of break this up. So one, he's going back into this conference that I was mentioning earlier, right? The Conference of African Writers of English Expression. And then he was saying that, so for this conference, you had to write in English to be included. So by default, that excludes anybody who writes in African language. So that's one of the restrictions that was placed on the African writers. One is this conference, right? The conference only validates English writers. So then he goes in the second sentence, he says, now looking back from the self-questioning heights of 1986. What does that mean? Have anybody heard the term hindsight is 2020? Nobody's heard that? Okay, so um, think about it this way, right? The past, we're, having, we're gonna have a temporal conversation, a conversation around time. So the past, you can look back into the past, you can look at yesterday and see everything that happened yesterday, right? You can kind of visualize or recollect your happenings of what happened in the past, correct? Y'all with me on that? That makes sense? Okay, so what you cannot see is what's gonna happen in the future, right? You can't see that. So hindsight, looking into the past, is always 2020. 2020 is recognized as the best type of vision that one can have, right? So looking back, you have all the answers. Looking forward, you don't, you don't know because it's the future. You don't know what to expect. So what he's saying is looking back at the self-questioning heights of 1986, right? So I'm looking back to, from 1986 to when the conference took place in the 70s, and I'm saying, hmm, something's absurd about the fact that this is a conference of African writers that must write in English, right? So his hindsight allowed him to see the issue of that conference, whereas when he was attending the conference, he was just geeked to be there, right? So he didn't see any issues with the conference in that moment because he was just proud to be at the conference, right? So if we go further, he says, I, a student, 
could qualify for the meeting on the basis of only publishing two short stories, The Fig Tree in a Student Journal, and uh, Pinpoint, The Return, in a new journal, The Transition. But neither Shaban Robert, then the greatest living East African poet, with several works of poetry and prose to his credit in Kiswahili, nor Chief Faguna, the great Nigerian writer with several published titles in Yoruba, could possibly qualify. So check it. You guys are grad students, and this is what in Google is saying. So as you guys, as grad students, because you wrote in English, essays in English, and they get published, you're able to attend these conferences, right? I'm a PhD student, I'm a professor. I wrote poems and I wrote essays in Swahili, right? I can't go to the conference because I write it in Swahili. So I'm the greatest recognized poet in the land and I can't attend, but you guys are just undergrad students and you get to go to the conference, right? We're all African, right? But you guys who are less qualified, but because you write in English, get access to the conference Whereas I, who am overqualified, but I don't write in English, don't have access to the conference, right? So this is the absurdity and this is the contradiction that Ngugi is pointing out. So when Montserrat is talking about those restrictions, this is one of those restrictions, right? The conference is only validating a certain writer who writes in a certain language, right? So that's the explicit restriction, right? So that's like in the in your face restriction. Implicitly, the underlying is restriction it's the value of language, right? English language is more valued than Kikuyu, than Bantu, than Swahili, than any other of these indigenous languages. So that's another restriction that's being placed on these writers is, well, how do I get my writing to be validated if I'm not writing in these colonial languages? Also, the point that Mantra brought up is access, right? So not everyone in the globe could read Kikuyu or could speak Kikuyu. But there's more people on the globe who could speak English, right? So if I'm trying to be marketable and I'm trying to publish and sell my book, I need to write in a language that the majority could understand. So does that kind of help you make a little bit more sense, Mashra, of those restrictions? Yes. And then we have one more person for the fishbowl and then we'll open up to the overall class. And then one real quick, I'm sorry, you guys, real quick. If you are gonna try to bar, uh, bring our attention to a point, please give us the page number so that way we'll know, you know, what page to look, we can follow along as well. Oh uh, yeah, so for me on page three, if I'm not wrong, uh, do I read it? Yeah, if you want to. Um, it says the effect of the cultural bomb is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, in their languages, in their environment, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. It makes them see their past as one wasteland of non-achievement, and it makes them want to distance themselves from that wasteland. It makes them want to identify with that which is the furthest removed from themselves. Um, for instance, with other people's languages rather than their own. So for me, like, I found that interesting. I might be wrong, though. Like, I feel like it relates to, like, today's world, how, like, people see other people differently and, like, make them feel out of place. And it, it can cause some of them to change and try to assimilate, which makes them, like, forget where they actually come from in the future. Yeah. That's a very good point, Mantra. And, and I, to me, that I highlighted that very same passion to myself. Um, and this notion of a cultural bomb is fascinating to me. Like, if you think what a bomb does, right? It explodes and it dismembers, right? It, it tears apart, it takes limbs off, it, it tears down buildings, right? So what he's saying is imperialism, colonialism served as this cultural bomb to disrupt and disembody indigenous culture, right? And, and in this case, we're talking about indigenous African culture, but we could broaden that context and we could talk about indigenous culture on this country, right? Thinking about the Aztecs, the Incas, and, and the people who were on this country prior to Columbus's arrival, right? Once Columbus got here, he initiated the cultural bomb, right? You could no longer speak your native language. You had to either speak English or Spanish, right? 
Um, you couldn't wear your hair in the fashion that the natives wore their hair. You had to wear your hair like they wore their hair. The clothes that you wore, you could no longer wear those. You had to wear Spanish conquistador clothes, right? So this is the cultural bomb that Gengubi is talking about. So it disembodies, it dismembers your culture, and it makes you see value in a foreign culture. And typically, that foreign culture that you're forced to see value in is the culture that's oppressing you. Right, so you see more of a value in the oppressor than you do in your own, right? Um, and Maladoma Patrice Somais talked about that a little bit, right? He says it would be weird for me to wear my African attire back home because they're looking at me like, bro, you got a PhD, you should be wearing an Italian Gucci suit. Like, what you doing in this dashiki and this bobo? Like, that's you tripping, right? This is what um, Somais is talking about. Also, we have been constructed not to see value in the, even in our own attire. Right? So what Ngugi is dealing with is how we have been constructed to not see value in our own language, right? Um, for, my, for my bilinguals in the class, and this may play out for you guys in the space of, you know, wanting or being forced to speak English and then saying, nah, we don't, you know, don't speak English, Spanish, right? So that's, that's a way that you are being forced to devalue your indigenous culture, even though Spanish is a, is a colonial language as well. But there's still this level to where to be American, what you must speak English, right? So now the cultural new bomb is playing out that your Mexican culture or your um, El Salvadorian culture or wherever that is from is being exploded and you're being forced to assimilate to American culture, right? So that's the very same way that this um, cultural bomb plays out. Um, for my Black folks who are not born on the African continent, right? There is a certain culture that we possess as well, right? Um, the reason why um, in 2018, California and New York passed a law that said Black folks could wear their hair in the workplace naturally and not be fined for it, right? So there's laws that say if you have your hair in dreads or in locks, you cannot work for us, right? So New York and California said that that's illegal. So, but think about what that means. That's a cultural bomb, right? So what locks are is when your hair for African people grows naturally, it starts to formulate and collect, right? That's just your way that your hair naturally grows. So if you don't brush your hair, you don't comb your hair naturally, that's what our hair will do, right? So with this loss, what these rules say is the way that your hair naturally grows out of your head, we will not hire you, nor can you work here in this establishment. So what you must do is straighten it, hot comb, right? Um, put a weave in it so you can look, your hair could look like ours. Now we're comfortable enough to allow you to be in our space and we could um, have you work for us, right? So your innate way that your hair grows, cultural bond, we don't want to have nothing to do with it. You must value this look of straight hair, right? Because that's professional. Cultural bond, just, it plays out in the same fashion. So what did, what did other people think about um, the readings outside of uh, Majorat, Majorat, and um, Jocelyn? And remember, the fishbowl is supposed to lead into a larger group conversation. We could volunteer. I could just start calling on people at random. It's up to you guys. Um, you um, what kind of like? Oh, I'm talking. Hi. Um, what kind of like clicked when I was listening to what you were just saying right now? It kind of reminded me about how um, how kids are like kindergarten students are treated inside school, like when they're speaking, you know, Spanish or if they're they're native. I'm just speaking Spanish because that's more common where I am. Um they're told like no that's that's not the word you have to say this word instead when they're like okay well i i hear water as awa not as water when every it's kind of a universal thing like most most people know that awa is water so um you don't just see it like as you get older you see it as like right when you're a child you get put into that like you have to speak english and you're even even today if they're telling you you have to know english in america to get where you want to be and if you learn if you know spanish then good keep it but at the same time they're slowly taking it away from you as a child and then to your point like think about this idea right like 
English or the ESL classes, um, implicitly embedded in that is the idea that because you speak multiple languages, you're not as smart as someone who just speaks English, right? Like how asinine is that? Like, so somebody who can speak two languages is vastly more smarter than somebody who just speak one, right? But because you're bilingual, you're kind of siphoned off into this class with just the people who are bilingual and you're looked at like you're not as intelligent as those who naturally speak English. Where in reality, the people who are bilingual are highly more intelligent because you have two modes to be able to process information. I could process it in Spanish, I could process it in English. I could process it in Kukuyu, I could process it in English, right? So you have a higher level of intellect operating through your psyche, but because of the way that this country is operated, Eurocentric thinking is valued. So you're more smart if you just speak English. You're more global, you're more universal, which is bullshit, right? If you think about that logically, that does not make fundamental sense. Good point. Uh, I wanted to also bring up another point. Um, so kind of what, like what Samantha was saying, um, one thing that kind of brought up to mind was just the fact that um, so we all have to take as a requirement for high school Spanish, right? Some, one of the biggest things that I noticed when I was taking this course was learning it was very different from how I was taught at home. And um, obviously the Spanish that they teach in, you know, high school setting in America would be, you know, Spanish. It's all like, you know, like um, European Spanish, right? It's very, very different from, you know, Spanish from Mexico or any other, you know, part of Latin America for, um, you know, that part. So I think personally, like I did, it was very different adjusting to European Spanish more because there were some words where I was like, wait, what, you don't, we don't use that, yeah. right? At home, it was taught very differently. And, you know, and I was very fortunate enough that I made it to AP Spanish. But um, like I said, it, it is very different having to make that adjustment. I, I took that shit three times. I barely passed with a D minus. So I, you know, I, I understand. I understand how difficult it is. What are some other thoughts about the reading? I thought it was interesting how on page eight, um, the writer talks about how. Hold on. Uh, he wants to still use English as a way to communicate him through African philosophy, folklore, and ideas, and how, um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes, I don't know. And how he finds language to be spiritual segregation. I thought it was interesting how he wants to illustrate his experience still like knowing English, but wanting to speak in um, Swahili um, to communicate his uh, method across of why he thinks he should be able to speak in his mother tongue. I don't know if that made sense. Sorry, I was confusing. It, it did. So like really, and what, what Miracle did effectively was she triangulated three separate issues, right? Um, one, the subjugation of the spiritual subjugation found in language, right? Um, this notion of using English to try to carry African ideas. And then, and Gooby saying, like, nah, I'm about to move and I'm about to write in my native tongue, right? So, like, let, let's kind of work through that because within this conversation, it's also uh, a depiction of method. And we can discuss method very, very concisely here. So, so if we go to the bottom of page eight, right? And right before that break in the final paragraph, he, he writes, here we were more assertive of our rights. Chinawana Achibe wrote. So this, what I'm about to read on the very bottom is words from Chinawana Achibe. Now, little background, Chinawana Achibe is a very famous African writer um, he wrote the novel, Things Fall Apart. It was one of the widely recognized um, African novels that we produced, right? So at this time and at this conference, Ngugi, um, who is, you know, looks up to Chinawana Echibe, he kind of interacts with him and they kind of talk about this notion of using English to carry conversations further, right? African conversations further. 
So he says, I feel that the English language will be able to carry the weight of my African experience, but it will have to be a new English, still in fuel communication with its ancestral home, but altered to suit a new African surroundings. So this is what um, Achibe is saying, right? He feels that the English language is sufficient to be able to carry these African thoughts, but it's gonna have to be like a new English language, right? So I want to take you guys back to last week. Think about Somme and what Somme was writing about. What was Patrice Maladoma's Somme issue when he was trying to produce his autobiography? He said it took me four years, and there was a reason why it took so long. What was that reason? Because he didn't want the he didn't want it to the the meaning of the book to be lost when it was translated into English. Correct. So he was saying that there's going to be African nuances that will be lost when we translate this from English, right? And for my bilingual folks, you know that there's certain words that we have in English that there's not words for in Spanish, right? And vice versa. So this is what, I'm sorry, this is what Somme is talking about. But here we have Achibe who is saying the opposite, right? So we have two opposing forces at play. So the question should become for y'all as thinkers reading this, well, what does Ngugi feel about this, right? We know that he looks up to Achibe, right? And then we go to page nine, like towards the middle, um, second par the very the end of the second paragraph. And he says, you know, how did we as African writers come to be so feeble towards the claims of our of our languages? Sorry, how did we as African writers come to be so feeble towards the claims of our languages on us and so aggressive in our claims on other languages, particularly the language of our colonization? So what he's asking now is how are we as African writers gotten to the point to we're willing to support our colonizers language, English, French, Spanish, right? But we don't want to deal with our own language. So in a way, he's kind of talking shit to Chibe. It's like, bro, you over here trying to talk about English, you're trying to hold up English, but you don't even want to deal with your own native language. So how do we as thinkers get to this position, right? So these are two things at play, and we talk about this notion of a counter argument, right? So he uses a Chibe on page eight to produce his counter argument. Because obviously, if you look at the title of the book, decolonizing the mind, you know that he does not agree with the colonial language, right? You, you know that, right? Even me telling you that he says, this will be my last book right in English, you know that he does not agree with the colonizing mind. So as you're reading through this, you see the words of Achibe, and it seems like he's supporting this notion of English being a, a possible conduit for African activity. That should cause some suspicion in the back of your mind. You should be like, mm, that shit don't make sense, right? Why, if you're trying to decolonize your mind, would you want to use English? It seems like a, it's a contradiction, but it's not. That is his counter argument, right? So he pulls out this counter argument and he gets you to think about this just so he can pose the question, how do we become so feeble in our relation to our own language, right? So all of that on page eight is just to get you to the question posed on page nine. How do we get to where we don't value our own language, right? And a part of that ties back to the conference that started the whole conversation. Because again, this conference is valuing the English language over the indigenous African language. Does that make sense? So do you see how what Miracle was kind of driving at speaks to three separate components of Gu in Googie's writing? Uh, what else? What else you guys find it of interest? What about the idea, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, um, Valeria. Um, I don't remember who mentioned it, but I believe they were talking about how um, the character speaks about like changing themselves or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, earlier this week, for one of my other classes, I was reading about that in the textbook, and it wasn't just with African Americans, but mainly with Asians as well. And there was this whole idea of like, 
for example, because with the Asians, they said that their eyes were too small, that their nose were too big, lips were too big. And for some features, they said bigger was better. And there was actually some things that they practiced where they would pinch their nose each day until they noticed it would get um, skinnier. And then they will tape their lips down as well to make them more like fine. But um, like they will pass that on from generation to generation, even though it didn't really change anything. So Valeria, how would you relate that to the cultural bomb that Ngugi is talking about? And think about, go ahead, think about what a bomb does, right, to the body. So every, anybody, so she, she's talking about, you know, the Asian community and how they were forced to fit, change their features. Essentially what she's saying, right, um, would pinch their nose till the nose got smaller, tape down their lips until the, um, the nose, I'm sorry, till your lips get thinner. I even heard um, to where they would break your feet so it wouldn't grow past a certain size because small feet were valued in certain aspects of Asian culture. So how does that speak to this idea of a cultural bomb, right? So when Googie says the cultural bomb disembodies culture, right? Um, it destroys your indigenous culture and makes you see value in a foreign culture. So in this case, when we talk about disembodiment, it's a literal translation. They're literally destroying their body to look more European, right? Um, if you go into the Caribbean, um, Jamaica, Barbados, um, San um, Martinique, go to West Africa, Nigeria, um, this phenomenon of skin bleaching, right? So they're little, Sammy Sosa, y'all seen Sammy Sosa lately? Looking crazy as hell, right? Skin bleaching, he's bleaching his skin to look more European. He's destroying his natural look to look more like a European, the cultural bomb. It's, it's the same premise. Um, so yes, yeah, very good point, Valeria. And so what Valeria is doing is which, what I call an, an analysis, right? So I read what Googie, and Googie wrote, but it made me think about something I read in my other class, and I'm making the connection between the two. That's an analysis. Um, what do you guys think about this production of a new English, right? Do you think that's a possible? Can you think of examples of, a, the, of the production of a new English? Um, well, I have two things. One, mm -hmm. the feed binding in China, and specifically China, wasn't necessarily for European features. It was mainly to keep women's feet small so they couldn't run away mm -hmm. in a misogynistic sense from whatever husband was chosen. And number two, what exactly do you mean in New English? I feel like you're not exactly talking about like a like you know new english just like new slangs or whatever but i'm still not so sure what you mean by new english so let's let's go to um and google and see what he means by new english so on page nine um and he's pulling from gabriel okara right this is what gabriel okara says some may regard this way of writing english as a de des desecration of the english language this is, of course, not true. Living languages grow like living things, and English is far from a dead language. They are American, West Indian, Australian, Canadian, and New Zealand versions of English. All of them add life and vigor to the language while reflecting their own respective cultures. Why shouldn't there be a Nigerian or West African English which we can use to express our own ideas, thinking and philosophy in our own way? So this is what Ngugi means by the new English. Does that make a little more sense for you, Jocelyn? Uh, yes, sorry, I had to find the thing. Okay. Um, can, I, can I say something? Yeah, of course. Okay, so I was thinking about in response to that and just in general, um, on page four, it says the choice of language and the use of, and the use to which languages put to a people's definition of themselves in relation to their natural and social environment and blah, blah, the universe. And so in that, in connection with um, the new English, I, um, well, 
it might be a little strange to say, but like, of course, nobody wants to be colonized. So it's not the fault of the colonized to be forced to speak English and not have that much of a choice to present or, or preserve their own culture because by basically eradicating African ethnic languages, I guess you could take a deep stab at it and almost say that it's a genocide of culture and specifically in the under the branch of culture language. And um, in back to your thing about like the new English is that I feel like the new English has mainly become a weapon of white westernization and it's overpowering and dominating and takes up a lot or too much space in comparison to other um to other um languages like even if you're not like one of the top five hit languages like you know english spanish french blah 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 like other more less popular languages um but then also at the same time i guess in a glo in in this 20 20th 21st century um i know his this book was written a bit towards the end of the 20th century but currently with all regards to the internet and whatnot which you know in this book when this was written there wasn't really much internet i think as much as the this new form the new english becoming like you know basically you know a weapon and like whitewashing but the one positive aspect that i could think and say of english is that it's sort of become a global um rosetta stone at the co at the expense of erasing some cultures like it depends on where you're from but I know in like China and Korea or other places and whatnot, as much as they learn their own native language, they tr they teach their kids to try to learn English as the second language, as much as some parts of America tries to teach Spanish as their you know top second language. And so that way, I mean, their purposes are the same purposes as um, the author describes is to climb up the social ladder, you know, China, Korea, blah, other places, grab, make sure you know English so you can grab a spot with, you know, the businessman, make sure you know enough English so you sound smarter and blah, 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 blah. And like, oh, wow, you can say, I speak English. Wow, you're so good. And like, whatnot, you know? Yeah, so what you're talking about, Jocelyn, is the globalization, right? So because of global, does everybody know what globalization means when I say that? Does anybody not know what globalization means? Uh, just for the sake of argument, right? Globalization is the idea of the world being smaller because now we can import and export from China, right? I could go to Mexico, get labor or get production of, from labor and then sell it in the Americas, right? So the world is no, now more interconnected on a global scale. The internet makes um, reaching out to foreign places a lot more reliable, right? You could, um, uh, we could what, what's at and text somebody in Africa or in Mexico like it's no big deal. This is this idea of globalization where the world gets shrunk. Um, and a large portion of this globalization is the pursuit of profit, right? So, so what Jocelyn is saying is, although they place great emphasis and great value on their home, on their native language, right? But they're also instructed to learn English so you can participate in the global market, right? So I can, as a businessman, operate not only in China, but in the Americas as well, because I know both languages. So that makes me a viable, business uh, um, accumulating entity, right? But so think about what they're saying in regards of this new language and what, what Ngubi is trying to get us to think about, right? So how come there can't be West African English, which we can use to express our own ideas, thinkings, and philosophies in our own way, right? And uh, to Jocelyn's point, this is written in 84, but I think and I would argue that there are new forms of English. Think about Creole. Right? Have y'all are y'all familiar with the dialect of, of Creole? Like have you? Yes. Okay. So and think about how that was cultivated, right? 
very much a, um, a production of the slave institution, right? So I'm gonna get Africans from Ghana, I'm gonna get Africans from Nigeria, I'm gonna get Africans from Benin, I'm gonna put them in a ship together and we're gonna take them to Americas, right? So each of those Africans, they speak different languages. But what's happening is they're trying to communicate with each other while they're on the bottom of that boat. And they're trying to figure out what's going on, why are, you in, why are we in chains? Where are you from, right? So as this process goes on for centuries, so they develop that on the, um, in the boat, they get brought to the Americas, they're put on the plantation, these conversations are still going on. While in the midst of them trying to communicate um, Kukuyu and Bantu, right, or Kukuyu and Swahili, and they're trying to make a language out of two opposing languages, they're also being forced to learn English, right? So now it's the combination of Kukuyu, Bantu, Swahili, and English, which produces Creole, right? Um, you go down to the Caribbean, and a lot of the, the colonies were French colonies, right? So them learning how their, their native African language, they may speak Akan or they may speak Yoruba, but now French is infused into their Akan or their Yoruba, and it produces this Creole type of, of the language, right? So this kind of pertains to what um, Ngugi's getting about by this new English. Um, I'm 37, so I grew up in the mid 90s when I was like a teenager, right? So in the mid 90s, there was this very large conversation around Ebonics. Does everybody know what I say when I say Ebonics? Like, it's the, it's the black vernacular, which y'all would call slang. Um, essentially, at the time, the 90s, they called it Ebonics, right? So what they were trying to do was say that that is a secondary language. So I could put on my job application, I'm bilingual because I can speak standard English and I can speak Ebonics, right? So in Oakland, at the same time, around like 95, there was this move within the Oakland public school system to recognize Ebonics in the classroom. So if somebody came in talking in slang, it wouldn't be considered slang, it would be considered Ebonics and it would be authenticated in the classroom, right? Part of the pedagogy was for the, the, the teachers to know that language as well so they could interact and speak with them in this dialect and not chastise them for having that type of talk, right? I would argue also that's a production of a new English, right? So anybody familiar with Ryan Coogler? So y'all, I'm sure y'all seen the film Black Panther. You've seen the film, um, what's that shit called? Fruitvale Station with him and Michael B. Jordan about Oscar Grant. Um, I believe Creed was also produced by Ryan Coogler. So he's a movie producer who produced Black Panther, Creed, Fruitvale Station. He's from Oakland right? He's, we're around the same age. So it's safe to assume that he came up in the school system that supported this idea of Ebonics. Um, for my sports fans, if you ever heard Marshawn Lynch ever give an interview or ever heard him talk, he talked like a motherfucker from Oakland, right? Like if you've ever been to Oakland, there's a certain way that they all speak. And, and what's funny about Oakland is you could be Asian, you could be Mexican, you could be Black, you could even be white. If you're from the hood in Oakland, you have a certain Oakland dialect, right? Ryan Coogler, the same thing. When you hear him give an interview, I mean, he could have just won the Oscar and given his expect acceptance speech, he talks like the average motherfucker from Oakland, right? Um, part of the reason why I go about my pedagogy in the classroom and I use cuss words and I use slang and I don't talk like your average professor all buttoned up is to support this notion of street lingo being as authenticated form of expression, right? So I bring that up to say there's ways that this new English is being produced, but it's not always recognized on the mainstream level, right? But what's happening because of forces like hip hop, these expanded English, right, is now becoming mainstream. So where you'll hear um, slang or black vernacular or ebonics in commercials now, right? Um, you'll hear hip hop, vocabulary brought into the corporate boardroom, right? So this new English that I'm assuming is being produced from black culture is now becoming pop culture in America, right? So, and let's just call it what it is, pop culture in America is black culture. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's really no, there's no way around that. Um, from the aesthetic of the look of what is cool, is black, right? 
um, music is black. And now you're seeing a wave of even um, visual production, movies being really pushed in a, in, a, in a aesthetic that is black, right? So black culture is moving American culture. So that's kind of where I situate this notion of, of the new language being produced, right? Um, and then when we get into next week's reading, we'll dive into this notion of Creole and the open boat a little bit deeper. But before we break out, um, Precious, we have not heard from you today. Yanelli, we have not heard from you today. Helena, we have not heard from you today. So let's let us hear from y'all and then we'll call it a day. So Precious, Helena or uh, Yanelli. Just your comments on anything that was discussed today or the reading or anything. Um, I like to uh, comment on um, how the world, like how pretty much what you're saying when you're destroying your, yourself by like kind of abandoning your culture mm -hmm. based on today's society standards of speaking English and, you know, the colonization. And I find it really, um, I have a question to it. Okay. that in today's society would that ever be a change will there ever be a change for that to be normalized for a cultural background like to have like for to finally be proud of it if that would be possible um yeah it's possible um and the only way that i could foresee it being possible is that we uproot those who are and power in making the decision to say, yeah, this is validated or this is not, right? And, and to me, that's the only way um, that that could happen. But at the same time, I think we're in the process of that because what's gonna happen is, um, as you guys are getting this information, you guys are gonna go on and do whatever your career is and you could use this information to inform your work. And that can start the process of this changing, right? So, um, Yes, it can happen, but I don't think it's going to happen overnight, and it's not going to happen without struggle, work, and sacrifice. Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I want to reflect on what you guys were saying about, um, like, how, like, the languages that it's now used, and, you know, you have to, like, learn, like, you have to write English and, and stuff like that, and um, it's just the language that, you know, most people are used to. But you know how some people say like, oh, you're gonna get a better like job, better career if you're like bilingual, like that job is gonna help you more, like you're gonna get more out of it, um, as well as like the pay. Because some people say that you get paid more, you know, you know, two languages. So also like I just don't think it's fair for how those stories to like, oh, like they had to write it in English, you know, because they had their own language but they wouldn't they weren't able to like go based on what they knew and the language that they were used to. So I just feel like that was very, very unfair. Yeah, and, and then I think too, so one of the things to think about is, is as scholars, like how do we combat that, right? Like how do we correct course and how do we write that wrong? You know what I mean? Um, because also like a lot of these motherfuckers who put this stuff in place are getting old and they dying off, right? And their spaces have to be filled. And who is going to fill those spaces and what is going to be the ideology or the mentality of the people filling those spaces? Uh, Precious, we haven't heard from you today. Um, I actually thought it was really interesting how um, the book relates to things that are going on today and how, um, how you only had to speak English to get into the conference and how today sometimes that is also relates and how, <laughs> and how like, um, like today, if you speak two languages, I guess it's to your advantage, but sometimes it's like, no, you need to speak English in America. And that's just how our world works today. Yeah, the, the go back to your country, we speak English here, people, right? But I always pose the question, where do you come from? And what was you speaking when you got here? Because typically where they come, then none of them are originally people from here, right? Because if you was originally from here, you wouldn't look how you look. And typically, if you're originally from here, you wouldn't be speaking English. So the fuck are you talking about? All right, so check it out. Going into next week, uh, we're getting into um, Edward Lissant's, um The book is Poetics of Relation. Um, now, to understand what a poetic is is important because um, it's going to help you understand what you're reading, right? 
So when you think about a poetic, think about a poem and an essay kind of merged into one, right? So you have a little bit more flexibility with language. You have a little bit more flexibility with sentence structure. Um, it's not gonna read like your standard essay where you have an argument, a thesis, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's more of a free-flowing type of a poem. So with that being said, be patient with the read. Um, you know, trust your instinct when you're, when you, when you're reading it because it's not gonna be um, very clear, it's opaque, right? It's a little bit leaving a lot to your imagination and for you to kind of um, contemplate and decipher what Lisan is trying to get at, right? I didn't assign a lot of the reading just because of it being so opaque and I didn't want to um, turn you guys off. But if you take the time and give yourself time and, and maybe even have to read it a couple times, right? Or read what you just read, if you read a paragraph, you're like, eh, reread re -read that paragraph, right? But if you do that, and if you do that labor, and you engage with Lissant like he's demanding you to do, this idea of language and the production of language and this notion of creolization becomes really clear, and it allows you to see really how powerful that is and ways to kind of subvert this domination of Eurocentric language. Because a lot of what you guys are asking and a lot of what you guys are dancing around is like, how do we undermine this notion that you have to speak English or whatever your native culture is, is not important. How do we work around that? And what Glissant is writing about, although it's poetic, is dealing strictly with that, right? How do you undermine this notion of being a fugitive, right? Um, stealing yourself from enslavement and producing new realities from that state of being on the run, right? So this is what Lissant is in, in, you know, kind of playing with and experimenting with as it pertains to language and as it pertains to this notion of creolization. So when you read it, think about, you know, food and seasoning, how it's being mixed together to produce like a gumbo, right? Um, think about how jazz music is initiated. You, you have your horn section, your um, drums and your pianos, they all merge together to make one sound, right? This is Creo. So when you read about it, have that in the back of your mind and I'll help you make a little bit more sense of what you're reading. Um, if there's no more questions, I'm gonna stop the recording um, and I'll